Um, it's uh, really quite amazing, if not stunning, to be back here. I'm developing a cosmic relationship with Berlin. Um, and I'm really driven at the moment by a combination of caffeine and endorphins. They're the only things that are currently holding this physique in front of you. So uh, my aim is to teach, not to preach. But I've got a feeling that tonight, you see, it's a big trick. It's a big trick. You bring a scholar all the way across the world and give him two hours sleep in 48 hours to bring him across the world and then hope that he'll say something controversial that he will regret. And I won't disappoint you. I want to thank Ralph. I want to thank the Institute. I want to thank Christian and Karin and all the team that... Uh, that uh, gave me the opportunity to stand before you, and it was really only when I came out at the airport that I found out really what the topic of tonight is. And it's a good topic. It's a good topic because... Don't move. Did someone say don't move? I, I, do, I can make people seasick. Yeah, some people have difficulty following me. I'll try and curtail that. But if I stand in one spot, I will go to sleep. You know, some of you would be aware that the Jewish world, those of you who are inside it, and even those of you who are outside of it, but looking at it, would be aware that it's a very complex phenomenon. It covers a vast range of views and spectrums. There is no single Jewish view of the world. There are Jewish interests, but the views are vast and varied. However, it's no secret, and this is the controversial bit, and I need us to understand this, it is no secret that in the last two or three decades, the Jewish world has, and we're not going into the causes for this now, but the Jewish world has sort of moved to the right. And that's a combination of the traumatic condition that the Jewish people found themselves in after the Shoah and also the nationalist project of the State of Israel. And maybe that's where the Jewish people need to be at the moment. But there is a new Geist that is arising within the Jewish world. And I wasn't going to schlep myself all the way from Melbourne to Berlin to tell you what every other archiparchy can tell you. I'm going to talk tonight about a Ruach Chadashah, a new spirit, a cutting-edge new spirit that is really not new, but going back to look historically and textually at the sources of the Jewish people and what they're actually saying. Because there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that if the prophets of Israel were alive today, they would be very much in keeping with a political movement like the Greens or, <laughs> Ralph's laughing, or some other socially activist and even radical movement that is primarily focused on social justice. And we're going to talk about social justice a little bit, but we're going to talk about this vast prophetic revolution and really divine transformation that happened to the Jewish people a long time ago. And I'm going to show you that. As you know, I'm very, very fond of timelines. Some people get scared of timelines. Don't freak out. It will all be clear, basically. And as I always say, don't try this at home, especially if you don't have paper on the wall. But. Right. I love speaking here because if I say something funny, people are laughing like five seconds later when the translation comes. It's nice, it's cute. <laughs> I'm going to call this, I'm going to, <laughs> you see? <laughs> you see? I'm going to call this minus 500. That's 500 BCE. That's a prox. Let me, uh, sorry, 
approximately, in Australia we say approx, approximately 2,500 years ago. And I'm going to call this a very, very zoomed in timeline. I'm going to call this minus 800. So really we're just working here. Some of you have seen my timelines before. But really we're just working here with 300 years or so. Okay? I just want to go here for a minute, which is really at the end of what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, 2,500 years ago, in around 500 BCE, as would be familiar to some of you who've studied history, is that something very strange happened around the world. There was a kind of an intellectual thought paradigm shift that happened in a variety of places about 500 BCE. 500 BCE is the golden age of philosophy in Athens. It is also the time of the Buddha. It is also the time of Confucius. It is also the time of Zoroaster. In many different places, there is a thought transformation happening. So the question is, with the Jews, with the Jewish people, who kind of regard themselves as at the center of anything intellectual going on, where was our revolution? Where was our thought transformation? And the reality is that it had happened in the preceding two centuries. So I want to take us back to that world. And we're going to that world, and that world is very, very much focused on the Middle East. It's focused on the Levant. It's focused on what we call the land of Israel. And we need to set some historical conditions, and I need to take off my jacket before I melt. It's winter in Melbourne at the moment. It doesn't snow, but it's colder than that. Tonight, I'm going to talk about 12 texts. 12 texts. That's kind of in an hour. He's got less than five minutes per text. Plus, he's got to talk about the themes. He's got to embed them historically. How's he going to do that? We'll do it. I'm going to talk about 12 texts which are known as the minor prophets. We call them in Hebrew the tre asar, the minor prophets. There's nothing minor about them. They're just minor in relation to the three big prophets, which I informally call the big daddy prophets. And clustered around them are these minor prophets. You can read, most of them are very short books. So you could go home and read them for yourselves. Each one would take about 10 minutes max to read, each one individually. I don't suggest you do it all on one night. Your head will explode. But they are short texts. But what I want to facilitate this evening is an awareness of where they are placed historically and socially in the continuum of thought. And when I say they're grouped around three big daddy prophets, let's put those on the timeline. We can't, unfortunately, tonight go into detail on those, but they're very important to give us a reference for the 12 prophets, known as the 12, that we're going to talk about. Some people think of, oh, the 12 prophets, there must have been 12 guys sitting around a table. But in fact, these are 12 prophets spread over several hundred years. The first big daddy prophet is sitting here. What color is this going to be? Orange? Mm. That is Isaiah. He's here. Around about minus 720, minus 700. And those are crucial historical circumstances that we're going to look at in a moment. But I just want to get these three so we can see how the others are grouped around them. The second big daddy prophet is sitting here. And that, of course, is the prophet Jeremiah. And he is about a hundred years later in a very different set of historical circumstances. A lot has happened in that century. And he's kind of talking to different challenges than Isaiah is. And the third big daddy prophet is living 
just here, not long after, but he's already in and it, what we call the exilic. He is already after the destruction of the temple, and that, of course, is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is sitting in Babylon having his massive visions of the divine as part of this process of the universalization of the concept of God and ethical monotheism. So these are three big prophets that I just want to place historically so that we can see how they work in relation to these other 12. And in order to do that, now we really have to go into exactly, I have to spend a few minutes talking about what's going on when we start this revolution that I've yet to say what it is, but we're going to find out what it is. How many of you are aware of the kind of historical circumstances surrounding this particular period? Just so I have an idea. Okay, good. One or two. If you had all put your hand up, my entire talk would be a waste of time. So it's very good that few people put their hand up. Let's look at this now. You would be aware that uh, Jewish history <laughs> is long. It has a vast documented record of existence. And once we, once we even back here, even back here, the circumstances we're talking about do not come from the comic books. They are real objective historical circumstances that are verified by other historical and archaeological documents. Once we move into this phase already, we are no longer simply in the proto-historic, we are in objective history. If you go to the British Museum and you go to the Assyrian room, you will see documentation of the kings of Israel bringing tributes to the Assyrian emperors and so on. This is already in objective history. But the situation is this, that we have in fact, that, that of course, <laughs> to those of you who are familiar with, uh, with my talks, uh, that of course is the land of Israel. The, I mean, well, just to put that in perspective, you are aware that that, of course, is the Mediterranean. And for those of you who are confused, there's the water. And the land of Israel is sitting here. So the land of Israel actually is split. This is more or less, more or less contemporary Israel today, more or less. But the land is split in two. It's got two different kingdoms going on. There is a kingdom in the north called the Kingdom of Israel. And it's comprised of ten tribes. You see, twelve tribes had come together a couple of centuries before this to form a united monarchy. But now it is split. The northern kingdom of Israel contains ten tribes. And its capital is Samaria. And the southern kingdom is the kingdom of Judah that contains two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and has Jerusalem as its capital. And of course, political stability is far greater in the south because of the Davidic succession. So that everybody knew who was going to be the next king it was going to be a son or a nephew or a grandson or a relative of the house of King David. That was the Davidic dynasty that ran through the monarchy in the kingdom of Judah. But in the north, it was much more chaotic and the main means of accession to the throne was by violent political assassination. If you woke up one morning, probably a Monday, and you wanted to be king, you would take your best weapon and if you got close enough to the king and you killed the king and enough people were happy with that situation you would become king and that's how it was in the northern kingdom for a while 
But here already we had started to develop some stable dynasties in the north, but it was on much weaker foundation. Even if that thing itself is salvation, it is still idol worship. It's a very big message. But we're going to move on because... <laughs> Why do I keep dropping this? One of the things that the prophets of Israel introduced to the world. I mean, they actually, this entire period is responsible for introducing major theological themes that really weren't around before. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those is this concept. I'm and once again, once again, those of you who are sitting there going, I can't believe what I'm listening to, um, just bear in mind. I mean, I'm teaching. I'm not preaching. I'm teaching. But there is a there is an idea that comes into the world here which we take for granted today but really it's the prophets of Israel in this particular thought revolution who introduced this idea and it's an idea of personal transformation we call that concept in Jewish culture and thought we call that concept teshuva now the word teshuva is often badly translated as repentance. But it actually means response. It means answer. It means a reaction to a challenge. And as I have said often, and I've even said it in this room before, and please forgive me, that the real process of teshuva, you see in the Jewish world today, people think that Teshuva means that next week I'm going to start keeping the Sabbath, I'm going to start keeping kosher, I'm going to start going to the synagogue, I'm going to become religious. And they think that is the meaning of Teshuva, but that is a highly corrupted meaning of the word. The process, the journey of Teshuva begins with the question, why am I an asshole? That is the beginning of Teshuva. And teshuva effects an inner transformation. I know, you can't believe you said it, right? An inner transformation. Transform yourself to an authentic living and you will find that the universe is transformed around you. It works, says the prophet. It works. It is granted not only to individuals but to nations. All journeys of authentic living begin with self-critical reflection. And that transformation can lead to what the prophets are ultimately talking about, the messianic era where the world itself and humanity as a species is transformed because they have gone through this exercise of self-reflection. Why is this emanating from me? The universe, how it is, emanates from my, <laughs> the authenticity of my life. So the next big prophet, um, who's got a watch? Uh, okay, good. <laughs> so it's 22. All right, we've done one. Okay, not a problem. I'm not, do I look worried? I'm not worried. The second prophet of these 12 is a prophet called Yoel. Now, we don't know. Yoel's one of those books of the Bible that we really don't know where to place. If we have to be completely honest. We don't exactly know what its dating is. But it appears in the Hebrew Bible after Hosea. So I'm going to put it here. And Yoel are three short chapters focused precisely on this concept of teshuvah. That if you are going to effect a journey of repentance, once you realize how corrupt and exploitative your life is, that it must be an inner transformation. Rip apart your hearts, not your clothes. It is not a case that, that's what he says, it's not a case that you're going to sit down in sackcloth and ashes and you're going to fast and you're going to wail and whatever. That will affect nothing. It is an inner transformation. And then, then we get a big one in this same grouping in the northern kingdom during the time of Jeroboam II. And that, of course, is the prophet Amos. Amos was a farmer. 
from Tekoa. Probably he came from the southern kingdom. He is the first, not only in these phenomenal chapters, phenomenal, there's only nine chapters in Amos, but they are all amazing, in which he goes through the sins of various nations, and especially of Judah and of Israel. Al michram bakesef tzadik ve'evyona ba'avur na'alayim. Why? What is the great sin? That they sell the righteous person for silver and the poor man for a pair of shoes. Everyone was becoming exploited in this society. Amos is the one that is the first explicit prophecy. As I said earlier, they weren't just exemplars in their own life. They also said things about the future like Hosea did. And Amos is the first prophet to say in the northern kingdom, this is going to end. You are ignoring the calls of the divine to transform your life. Something awful is going to happen and it's going to end this society. And of course, we now know, 2,700 years later, exactly what that was. It was just around the corner. Because during the 8th century, there's the Mediterranean, here's the land of Israel. Over here, in what is today northern Iraq, there is a nation that is building up power. It's all about power. Building up power and building up speed, and building up an agenda, and building up an ambition, until it becomes the first of the great unstoppable empires. There have been many since, but this is really the first expansive empire that we see in, uh, in this part of history. And that, of course, is... You know what? I'm going to put this down here, because it's just... What empire is that? The Assyrians. Of course, they're not really just the Assyrians. They're actually the Neo-Assyrians, because the Assyrians have been around for quite a while. And the Neo-Assyrians, the <laughs> it's hard for us to imagine today just the impact that the Assyrians had on the area around them, under leaders like Tiglat Pileser and so on. Amazing conquerors that basically started here and conquered everything around and they had an agenda and their agenda was expansion and they brought with them their own state religion and they brought with them their own culture the culture of Ashur Ashur was the name of the empire Ashur was the name of the god and in minus 720 the Assyrians come to the northern kingdom of Israel and they conquer it and they vanquish it and they ethnically cleanse it and they take the ten tribes away. Gone. It is from that moment that we are no longer the greater Israel, we are the Jewish people. We are just the remnant of Israel, we are Judah, Judaism, the Jewish people. That is a huge watershed in history. That's a game changer because 20 years later the Assyrians come back to do the same thing, to do the same thing to the southern empire, to Judah. And more on that in a moment. The fourth of the minor prophets is a very interesting book. It's it's only one chapter long, and conspiracy theorists love it. It is, of course, the book of Ovadia. And Ovadia is really a prophecy about one thing. It is a prophecy about the nation of Edom. Now, why conspiracy theorists love that is because everybody's trying to work out who Edom is. I mean, we know who the Edomites were. They were a nation living in the southeast of, 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 of this area. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, kind of, but, but, but southern Jordan and a bit beyond there. 
at some point they were occupying Petra and other places, but they're kind of around that area. They were succeeded later by other peoples that moved into the area. But <laughs> this prophecy about Edom and how Edom is going to get its comeuppance is interesting for two perspectives. One is that, first of all, God is not merely the God of Israel. God is a universal God that demands justice from all nations. And Israel were particularly upset at the Edomites because during the destruction of the temple, and the destruction of the temple takes place, the temple in Jerusalem. The destruction of the temple takes place there. And at the destruction of the temple, the Edomites were helping the Babylonians to do that. And so we were pretty upset at the Edomites. So a lot of people placed the book of Ovadia more or less here, although it appears in the Hebrew Bible back here after Amos, probably because they weren't sure where to put it. And there is a figure in the book of Kings around here called Ovadia, so they put it there, but it's more likely here. But the real reason why people are so excited about that is because in later Jewish history, Edom became identified with Rome. 500 years after here, Edom, for all sorts of complex reasons that I wish I was talking about tonight, but we're not, Edom becomes identified with Rome, and ultimately, Rome becomes identified with the spiritual discourse of Christianity. So in rabbinic literature, in deep inside rabbinic literature, like even in the Middle Ages, when rabbis want to talk about Christianity, but they can't talk about Christianity because they can't use those terms, they talk about Edom. But that is a very, very late interpretation. The Edomites of Vadya, what's really most important about the book of Vadya is this universalization of God's ethical demands. And then, of course, we have the book of Yonah. You are all familiar with Yonah, Jonah. Jonah has four very neat chapters. It's on a boat, it's in a fish, it's in a city, and then it's on a hilltop outside the city. And people go, oh, that's very nice. I mean, we all learn about Jonah when we are children. Lovely story, guy gets swallowed by a fish, how interesting. But the reality is, is that to realize the historical embeddedness of the book of Yonah and when it is set, regardless of its legendary status or its literality, but when it is set, Yonah is living during the time of Jeroboam II at the height of the power of the northern kingdom and he is sent out to prophesy a message of Teshuvah to Nineveh the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And he runs away because he knows that if the Assyrians were to effect some type of repentance, then they would be given the merit to be the instrument by which the northern kingdom would ultimately fall. And it's astonishing. Yonah is not asked to, like Hosea and Amos, to prophesy to the kingdom itself, but to go to another nation. The nation of Israel is not even mentioned in the book of Yonah. And of course, many, many deep mystical texts throughout Jewish history have come back to Yonah to talk about this idea that, of course, Yonah is an allegory. What's the meaning of the Hebrew word Yonah? It means a dove. And a dove is sent out. It means that when the Jewish people ignore the responsibility they have to be this beacon of divine call for social justice to the nations, then they are forced into exile. And exile, of course, are represented by the fish. So, you know, it's an astonishing book of universalization, which not everybody realizes. All right. And then, of course, and you know, just looking at the time over here, Menang. Of course, if I was going to pick one prophet to talk about tonight, it would be the one I'm about to talk about. We've got 12, but the one that I would really, really focus on if we had a kind of more 
luxury would be this one because he is a younger contemporary of Isaiah. And together with Isaiah, he watches the fall of the northern kingdom. There's the northern kingdom. The Syrians come, kaboom. <coughs> and his name, of course, is, and he's like in seven chapters. I mean, Isaiah is like 66 chapters. It's massive. It's sublime. It's this humongous world book of world literature. But the prophet Micha, which is seven chapters, basically takes the whole, it's like the whole of the book of Isaiah in turbo on crack. And what Micha and Isaiah are watching is not just the fall of the northern kingdom, but they're watching the Assyrians come back. The Assyrians come back 20 years later and they completely ravage the countryside of Judah. We now know, I mean, we now know through extensive archaeological excavations that the second largest town in the land of Israel, in Judah, was the town of Lachish. And they have uncovered all the evidence of the Assyrian destruction of Lachish. And the Assyrians describe the destruction of Lachish in their own chronicles. And it was a total, they wiped out, they devastated 46 towns across Judah. And they came to Jerusalem and they sieged it. And that was the end in around the year 702 minus 702. That was it. That was going to be the end of Jewish history. If you Google today the Neo-Assyrian Empire, you will see that they conquered everything except one tiny pixel represented by the city of Jerusalem. Because Isaiah and Micha had a contemporary who was the king, one of the few righteous kings, and Isaiah and Micha were begging the people to do a transformation, and they did this transformation, and Hezekiah took the letters from the Assyrians where they said, who do you think you are? No one's God has stood before us. And he takes them to the roof of the temple and he opens up the letters to the heavens and he goes, there is nothing I can do more now. It's up to you. And there's different accounts. The Assyrian Chronicles tell a different account from the, from the Hebrew Bible as to exactly what happened. But the historical fact is that the ginormous Assyrian army of, don't try and translate ginormous, it's a neologism of mine, it doesn't really work, enormous, massive, whatever. This enormous army of 200,000 people just simply went away. And Jerusalem remained unconquered. This was a, you know, Ha'am ha'ulchim b'choshech ra'u or gadol, says Isaiah, the people that walked in darkness saw a great light. So Isaiah is talking a lot about that, but in the prophet Micha. He summarizes this entire revolution. This entire revolution. All right. So God wants me to live a more authentic existence. He wants me to live existence that is more open and receptive to the divine call. What does that mean? Hashem does God want thousands of sacrifices of lambs with myriads of rivers of oil? Do I give my firstborn as a sacrifice? What do I do? Says Micha in chapter 6. If you read one chapter of this entire thing, read the sixth chapter of Micha. Go home tonight and read it. So you'll know I didn't make it up. He gidlecha adam matov. He's already told you, man, what is good. Uma Hashem doresh mimcha, and what God seeks from you. Ki im asot mishpat, just do justice. Ahavat chesed, acts of loving kindness. And walk humbly with your God. That is the essence of the authentic spiritual existence that emerges from an inner transformation. 
It is not a pursuit of power. It is not a pursuit of salvation or of happiness. It is not a pursuit of anything except being a conduit for ethical and just living. That is the key to that transformation. And Micha is huge. I know that I've got three minutes. Watch, it's okay. It's kind of not, but we'll make it okay. I mean, Ralph ate up five minutes, so I might take five minutes. In this, Hezekiah, unfortunately, was followed by some very evil kings. His son and his grandson, awful. And in fact, this entire period saw massacres of any dissenting intellectual or spiritual voices. There is only one prophet that emerges from this entire period that we have. And that is the short work of the prophet Nahum. It's three chapters. And during this period also, under leaders like Ashur Banipal, the Assyrians are simply expanding more and more. And Nahum's three chapters are about one theme. The first chapter is about the destruction of Assyria. The second chapter is about the destruction of Assyria. And the third chapter is about the destruction of Assyria. He prophesies that Assyria will fall. It will be destroyed. It's one of our actually sources for, uh, great sources for the details of exactly how that happened. And as we know, in 612, uh, Nineveh was sacked. And then uh, in, by 605, it was all over for the Assyrians after the Battle of Karchemish, which the Assyrians thought they might have a chance to win because the Assyrian emperor was ill, but Nabopolassar, but then Nabopolassar sent to Karchemish the Babylonian army with, under the leadership of his son, the crown prince, Nabukaduri Usur, who we know as Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar comes with this enormous army and not only schmeisses the, uh, the Assyrians, but also the Egyptians as well and everything. And now there's only one game in town. The book of Habakkuk, which is probably theologically the deepest book of all the 12, theologically speaking, Habakkuk is a contemporary of Jeremiah, sometimes spelled Habakkuk. How is it, God, that you are able to remain silent in the face of all this evil that has penetrated this society? The leaders have filled Jerusalem with blood. They have squeezed everything out of everybody. The all of the oppressed and the underprivileged, only for their own betterment. The leadership is gone. The priests are gone. The place is full of false prophets, idolatrous cults with orgiastic and child-killing sacrifices and everything. All the abominations that are awful are everywhere. And you remain silent. Oh, it's okay, says God. I'm going to raise up a new force called the Babylonians. And they're going to come and they're going to put a stop. They're going to wipe out everything. Everyone's going to get their comeuppance. And Habakkuk is standing there going, uh, wait a minute. The Babylonians are going to come. When the Babylonians come to Jerusalem, they're not going to say, oh, you're righteous and you're not righteous. So we'll kill you and we'll spare you. They're going to kill everybody. And where's the sense of justice? <coughs> because however bad things are, the Babylonians are actually much more wicked than we are. To which, obviously, if you're going to read one other chapter, after you've read the sixth chapter of Micha, you're going to go home and you're going to read the second chapter of Habakkuk. Because in the second chapter of Habakkuk is one of the most profound assessments, uh, uh, profound political assessments of the whole Bible. Where Habakkuk explains, or rather God explains through the prophet Habakkuk. And if you've gone to sleep, just wake up for a moment because this is very important. 
tyranny is the seed of its own destruction. Even mikir tizak v'chafis me'etzi ya'anena. A house that is built on corrupt foundations, the very bricks of the wall will call out and the beams of wood will answer it. The ends never justify the means. The means always determine the ends. The minute you sin, the punishment is born because you gave it life. And tyranny and tyrannical societies and oppressive societies will always bring about their own destruction. And what we understand from that as well, and God answers Habakkuk and says, well, actually, my justice is applied throughout history. What we understand from that, of course, is that really it's more about the questions than the answers. All spiritual journeys are about questions, not about answers. Religion deals in answers. And the prophets of Israel, if anything, are anti-religious. There's controversy for you. And then the prophet Sophania, who really gets involved. Sophania is a younger contemporary. I'm nearly there. Sophania is a younger contemporary of Habakkuk and Jeremiah. And in three chapters, he's talking primarily about the concept of exile. And that exile has a purpose. That whether individually or collectively, people go into both spiritual and physical exile in order to achieve this transformation and purpose for which they are in the world, and particularly the nation of Israel. No other nation gets to go in exile and come back, and exile and come back, and exile and come back. The Jewish people do that in order to establish their continuum in the world, in order to drive humanity towards this phenomenal vision that the prophets are giving us of the end of days. It is nothing less, listen carefully, because I know even if you don't agree, you're welcome to write to me, but listen. A lot of people think that the future, this concept that we now know as the future, was invented kind of in the 50s or the 60s, right? That's what invented this concept of the future. Progress then began the future. But in fact, these guys invented the future. An ideal, utopic future that emerged from humanity's ability to self-transform. That is what the messianic vision of the prophets is doing. Until then, people had talked about the past and they talked about the present, but not this amazing potential future. But these prophets could not stop the destruction of the temple. And the people of Israel went into exile. This is the Babylonian exile for 70 years, as prophesied by Jeremiah. And then at the height of their power, the Babylonians were conquered overnight. As the divine says right throughout the prophets, as he says in the prophet Ezekiel, I raised the high tree. I, I, sorry, I raised the low tree. I brought down the high tree. None of these things happen unless I am behind it. And at the height of their power, the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. And the great Persian leader, Cyrus, who starts this whole new idea about conquering, and we still have the Cyrus Cylinder, and says nations can return to their homelands and rebuild their societies. And so we came back, we came back and started the whole project that for the next 500 years is going to be known as the Second Temple. And as we came back, there are three more prophets. I'll have to deal with them collectively in a minute. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who are really sitting at least more than a century after, the, after these events, and they are in a society that is looking to rebuild itself economically and spiritually, and they are reminding the people, they are reminding the people of the concept of a balance in society, that it is not all about economic pursuit, and it is not all about religious pursuit, but there is a balance between the material and the spiritual in all societies that is required to be achieved. Obviously, Zachary is kind of on LSD over there. He's got some phenomenal uh, visions of the future and of the Messianic period and so on. And the last prophet, Malachi, comes back. 
and he says, you know, we're going to go back to the, we're going to go back to Moses. We're going to go back to the simple ethical demands that the divine makes upon us. And you know, at the end of days, I'm the last prophet, says Malachi. But at the end of days, prophecy is going to be restored. And that is why I'm in the last verse of the last prophet of the Bible. I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet. Elijah is actually a figure living back here. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. That's why in Jewish tradition, the appearance of the Messiah is always preceded by the appearance of Elijah the prophet. And what's Elijah the prophet going to do? I'm going to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children, of the parents to children and children to parents. This intergenerational harmony that is going to happen at the end of days is the key where we look to the past and we look to the future and the two are seen as informing and fertilizing each other. That is the key to understanding the Messianic period. And this thought revolution that no doubt tonight I'm going to feel actual pain about the things that I didn't say about it. But what I wanted to communicate is this phenomenal revolution that has already happened within the Jewish world before we even kick off with the massive paradigmatic shift that happens elsewhere in the world. I know I have gone five minutes over, but that's okay. We still managed to do it in an hour. These are the treas. I urge you, by the way, by the way, as and I always say this, these books, these texts are written in a certain language. They're written in Hebrew. And I know that that's kind of alien to many people. And I urge you to read them in whatever language, but if you do happen to have the ability to access them in the Hebrew, then I urge you to do that because they reach a sublime level of expression that it's very, very difficult to give over, even in as amazing a language as, as German and, uh, so if we, uh, or English. But if you, can, if you can read them in Hebrew. And uh, just to summarize, just to very quickly summarize, the prophets of Israel are giving us a universalization of God. They're giving us an understanding that the divine seeks ethical living. They're asking us to effect acts of self-transformation, not just to change ourselves individually and collectively, but to transform the world. And they're saying that if you do that, then you can actually arrive at a point that, at a historical age in which all of the world can live like this, as, as all of the prophets, not just Isaiah, but all of these prophets are saying, where there is a pure language amongst humanity, where war is an anachronism, and where nations and individuals and collectives are able simply to live in harmony. And that might sound naive and ideal, but it is totally achievable, says the divine. It is totally within our grasp to achieve it. And may we achieve that uh, sometime soon. Thank you very much for listening to that. It is... Now, I am, uh, I'm happy to take one or two unanswerable questions. Yes. Oh. Hello, Zvil. Tikkun um, Olam, bitte sagen, was das bedeutet. Ja, ja ich verstehe. Ja. Yeah, yeah, Tikkun Olam. Interestingly enough, Tikkun Olam, Tikkun Olam, uh, Tikkun Olam, which means the repair or the fixing or the correction of the world. Or the what? 
Yeah, well, repair, correction, uh, healing in a certain perspective, yes. Tikkun Olam is an expression that emerges primarily in the last 500 years or so. It's not an expression used so much by the prophets of this age. It's more emerging from the 16th century in just the last 500 years, which is extremely recent in Jewish history. But it emerges from this idea that, uh, effectively introduced by Kabbalists such as Isaac Luria, that the world is in a broken state. And that this broken state happened because of the inability of the world to handle the divine and it fell apart and yet sparks of divinity adhere to the broken part fragments of the world and our job is to heal the world healing and to repair the world to rebuild the world as a vessel that can contain the divine it is very very similar to some of these ideas now the contentious part of that is that in the Jewish world today there are those more progressive perhaps who feel that it is should be the focus of the Jewish world should be on Tikkun Olam we should actually be at the forefront of all social movements all social movements across humanity versus those who feel that really that's a nice that's warm that's fuzzy but uh, the Jewish people actually have to focus at the moment on survival and containment. And that really is the fault line theologically at the moment, probably in the Jewish world, as close as anything to how people are looking at the perspective of... You see, inside the Jewish world, there is this realization that we exist for a purpose. We don't survive from generation to generation to hand down the recipe for gefilte fish. We survive for a purpose. And that purpose is, in fact, to bring humanity to this new state of awareness. And that really is what Tikkun Olam's ultimate aim is. It is to repair the whole world. The question is, how much of our resources are we to pour into that versus other things? And that's, I'm very glad you raised that, because it's a very similar question. It's a very similar theme, reflected, but in a more contemporary mode. Yeah. All right. I'm going to... Oh, yeah. There is no question, there's no question that the uh, book of Revelation, which of course is outside the biblical canon that we're talking about, the book of Revelation is part of a, of a, of a different spiritual discourse. Uh, and, and I even realize that the sentence I just said is qualifiable, and I understand that. But there's no question the book of Revelation owes itself a lot to two fundamental books of the prophets which is the book of Ezekiel which speaks of the new Jerusalem and speaks of the whole all of the prophets speak of the role of Jerusalem there's no question that if the prophets were alive today they would have the perfect solution to the Middle East crisis there's no question and that would be this and it would be unbelievably left-wing unbelievably Jerusalem should be internationalized the United Nations should be moved to Jerusalem. And that would act as a symbol that if you could solve this problem, you can solve any problem. And that all nations would flow in and out and would be allowed to walk into Jerusalem, anybody at any time, so long as they were not armed. And that would be the solution. And you have a whole industry in Jerusalem just dedicated to administration and peace. You see, everybody knows how it's going to go. It's just how much pain and suffering and blood are we going to have to go through till we get there. <sighs> Ezekiel is talking about the New Jerusalem, and so is the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah also gives us this phenomenally revealed. If you open up chapters 10 to 14 of the book of Zechariah, you will think you are reading the news today. 
And that is, but, but be careful, but be careful, but be careful, but be careful, but be careful. Because at every age, you know when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, right? And they found, they found copies of the book of Habakkuk in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were 2,000 years old. Identical, of course, with the Habakkuk that we have today. They found a commentary which we call a Pesher. A Pesher is a commentary written in any particular generation where the books of the Bible are applied to their own times. So the book of Zechariah at the moment is a book that's very amenable to Pesher. You can look at it and you can go, my God, they're talking about us. And maybe they are. Uh, the book of Revelation, however, like the book of Daniel, which it also owes to, the book of Daniel. Daniel's not considered classically a prophet in that sense. And the book of Revelation, I'll just say one more thing about that, because the book of Revelation, like the book of Daniel, has not yet been understood. The book of Daniel itself. Daniel tells you, I do not understand my own book. And in fact, we know that the only generation that will understand the book of Daniel is the generation to which it ultimately applies. Um, sorry? Did someone say, why not? Oh, good. Oh, Because uh -huh. if you'd said, why not, I would have had a hard time answering that. Um, but it's an interesting question. They all feed into some of the kind of later writings that are happening, emerging in the first century, like the book of Revelation and so on. But they're obviously within the Hebrew tradition. They're not classically considered as the Bible. So I'd have no idea if that answers your question, but it allowed me to speak about it slightly. So that's good. All right, guys, thank you so much for attending, and I'm looking forward to catching up with some of you in the next few hours because we're going to stick around, and there's a panel discussion. We're going to see Matis Yahoo, and it's all very exciting. So. Uh, no more questions. Everyone understands the 12 minor prophets perfectly. Brilliant. Go home, read them, and enjoy.